911. Hey, can I have a police unit come by my house? Because I keep hearing sounds in the basement. What's your name? Sam. Okay, what kind of sounds do you hear? Noises, like something moving around down there. But this is this isn't my house. I'm staying at my girlfriend's house. Okay. We sat down and talked a few times about it. He didn't like talking about it. He showed me pictures, black and white, of the that night and the stuff that happened. Who's to say what his, his motive for those murders really were? Was it because of my music? Was it because he was crazy? Was he on drugs? Sorry, and uh, I had to do it. My mind just snapped. I couldn't control it anymore. That's it. Fuck you to the big world. Fuck everybody in the world. I can't stand this place. This video contains never-before-seen footage of Richard Samuel McCroskey. I wish that I could have not done this, but I just lost my mind and I did what I did and I gotta pay for it now. A young man who did something terrible. In the video, Richard is full of regret and apologizes for what he's done. He says he lost control of his actions and know he'll face the consequences. He also mentions his love for his parents and apologizes to them. To anybody that finds this, tell my parents that like, I love them. Richard recorded this video while he was staying in the home of his victims. He remained in the house with their bodies for days after the heinous act. Neighbors began to notice a foul smell in the area, but didn't realize it was coming from where the bodies were decomposing. Richard's actions were so horrific that the police didn't even want to describe the details beyond saying that the victims died from severe blows. What he did during the time he spent in the house remains a mystery. Now, let's talk about Richard's background. A young man named Richard Samuel McCroskey III. Richard, who was 20 years old, dreamed of becoming a rapper focused on horror-themed music. He lived in Castro Valley, California with his father and sister, but Richard had a tough time in school because others teased and bullied him. They made fun of his red hair and weight, making him feel bad. Eventually, things got so tough for him that he quit school. After leaving school, Richard turned to graphic design and the internet to find comfort and a way to express himself. These things became his way of dealing with the difficult times he'd been through. Richard had two sides to his life. In the real world, he seemed quiet and kept to himself, but when he went online, he had a different persona, with names like Little Demon Dog and Psycho Sam. Online, he showed a strong interest in the underground horrorcore scene. If you looked at his online profiles, you'd find disturbing things like talking about murder and creepy pictures of him in cemeteries with weapons. It's like he was really into dark and weird stuff. Even though this side of him was unsettling, he connected with others who shared his interests. One of the people he connected with online was a 16-year-old girl named Emma Kelly Niederbruck, who went by the name Ragdoll on the internet. Emma lived in Farmville, Virginia with her parents. She was homeschooled, so she didn't attend a regular school like most kids. At first, people described her as a friendly and well-rounded girl, but as she got older, she started to rebel against the norm. She got into horrorcore music, dyed her hair pink, and embraced a darker style. Emma's parents were Dr. Deborah Sue Kelly and Reverend Mark Allen Niederbruck. They were concerned about Emma's growing interest in horrorcore, a type of music about dark and scary things. Even though Emma's parents were no longer together, they still got along well. They even went to family counseling together, all for the sake of helping Emma. But as time passed, Richard's connection with Emma and her family took a terrifying turn. Richard had a fascination with darkness and violence, and it led to some horrifying events. He made videos that hinted at feeling really troubled and admitted to doing something wrong. He'd committed a terrible crime and stayed in Emma's family's home with their bodies still there, rotting away. The people in the neighborhood had no idea about the awful things happening inside that house. They thought the bad smell was from a dead animal. Richard's disturbing online personality seemed to match what he did in real life. He ran away from the crime scene leaving behind a set of unbelievable horror for the police to find. Nobody knew all the details of what happened during those days when he was in the victims' homes. This tragedy reminds us that there can be severe consequences when the line between what someone is like online and what they do in real life blurs. It's a clear lesson that sometimes 
Even the darkest interests can lead to sad and terrible things, affecting individuals and the whole community. Three young people got caught up in a web of online connections in a very dark and sad town where something was about to happen. Emma, Melanie and Richard all came together because they shared a strange love for horrorcore music, which is all about scary and creepy things. Emma, who went by Ragdoll online, met Melanie through a famous horrorcore musician called Rizakel. Rizakel had connected with both girls on a social media site called MySpace. They became friends because they both loved horrorcore and had similar interests in photography, makeup, and hairstyling. Even though Emma, Richard, and Melanie were friends online, things took a terrifying turn in their lives. Emma and Richard started to have romantic feelings for each other through their online chats. They decided to meet in person at a horrorcore music festival called Strictly for the Wicked in Michigan. Another friend, Melanie, also came along, and the three teenagers became really close friends through their online interactions. However, when they finally met in real life, things didn't go as smoothly as they did online. Emma, in particular, seemed like she wasn't happy with how Richard was in person. She didn't like that he was shy and maybe didn't look how she expected. During the festival, Emma started flirting with other boys and that caused problems between her and Richard. There are even rumors that they had a fight during the event. But despite these conflicts, they all returned to Emma's family home in Farmville and continued to spend time together. But then something terrible happened that shook up their already fragile friendships. Melanie disappeared, and her parents got distraught when she didn't come back home. Her dad went to Emma's house to check on her. When nobody answered the door, things got even more concerning, and Richard gave different answers about where the girls were. They called the police, who went to the Farmville home to check things out, but they didn't find anything strange. Well, yeah, this is Farmville Police Department. Okay, did you just speak with somebody at the residence? Uh, yes, I just spoke with, I guess daughter's boyfriend. Okay, well, I, I don't know. It, I, my sergeant went over there and he just said that it was a young kid, boy, and that um, Melanie and the girl she's staying with are at the movies now. Yesterday they went to Richmond. Vehicle had broken down and the cell phone's dead and that kind of thing. So is that what he talked to you about? That's what he told me, yeah. And like I said, I, but I don't know where the mother is. I don't know where, I mean, she's usually the one that I guess drives them around and she's just disappeared. I, I haven't spoken to her at all. The father I talked to earlier on today, right. he, went, he said that he was going to, he was on his way, he was, as a matter of fact, he was on the red line. I was talking to him. He was going through Farmville. He was supposed to stop at the house. I haven't heard from him since. Okay. Like I said, I, I just, I'm at this point. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to think at all. Okay. You know, and it's, him being at the movies, I just tried to call. He said that um, Emma tried to call, or just called him from the movies. And I tried to call the phone that um, he said she called from. There's no answer. It goes right into it. Okay. Melanie's mom asked Emma's dad, Mark Niederbrock, to investigate the situation. Unfortunately, what he found was really disturbing. It started a troubling story filled with lies, strained relationships, and a mystery just beginning to unfold. This story is a spooky reminder of how complicated things can get when you have relationships with people online. Sometimes what you think about someone online can be really different from how they are in real life. Hi, this video is for you, Emma, the ragdoll, amazing, amazing ragdoll. And when unexpected things happen, they can turn lives upside down. As the unsettling events kept happening, people got more and more worried. Melanie's mum, Kathleen, was perplexed and anxious. She hadn't heard anything from Melanie or her husband, Mark, who was going to check things out. Richard, the guy who knew the girls, was giving different answers about where they were. Kathleen decided to call the police to help her figure out what was happening. Kathleen worried even more when she didn't hear from Mark for a long time. She called the police again to tell them how concerned she was. This, this, this is what doesn't make sense. I mean, my daughter would call. Right. So I just don't know what to think. I, so, what scared me earlier, she was saying, oh, there's noise, there was noises in the basement coming from, you know, in the house. And, oh, I don't know. All right, if you don't hear anything from her, then just call us back and we'll, I'll send an officer back over there. Okay. Yeah, I've been, I mean, it just, like I said, it doesn't make, none of this makes I mean, any sense. 
sense at all. I, I've, I've heard that, you know, they were supposed to be home by 9 this evening and then 10 and then, you know, so I don't know. All right. Well, just try to, you know, wait and see if Melanie calls you in the next hour, and if not, call us back. I will. Thank you so much for your okay. help. Okay. You're welcome, as well. All right. Bye-bye. The police had already gone to the house in Farmville when they first heard that Melanie was missing. But when they got there, Richard told them that the girls were just out watching a movie. Even though Kathleen was increasingly worried, the police left without looking into things more deeply. However, as the night went on, Richard called the police again, but this time it was about strange noises in the house's basement. Hey, could I have a police unit come by my house? I keep hearing sounds in the basement, and I'm scared to go down there and check what it is. Okay, what kind of sounds do you hear? Uh, I, like noises, like something moving around down there. I think it's the dog, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we have two dogs, but one of them is upstairs. I just put him up there, and the other one might be down there, but I'm not sure if it's the dog or not. <clears throat> okay, and it's in the basement. What's your name? Sam. Sam. But this is this isn't my house. I'm staying at my girlfriend's house. Okay. All right. We'll get somebody to come up there. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Bye. The police returned, quickly looked around, and found nothing unusual. But this made some people wonder if the police were doing an excellent job of checking things out thoroughly. At the same time, people living near the house noticed a bad smell in the air, like something dead. They thought it might be from a dead animal. Even though there were a lot of signs that something wasn't right, the police didn't seem to dig deeper or see any signs that something terrible had happened during their first visits to the house. The story got even scarier when Richard called on the 17th. His sister found his message disturbing and she felt like something was wrong. Even though Richard seemed quiet and not very assertive, he appeared to have a lot of anger and hate deep down inside him. These strong feelings might have been made worse by how he was poorly treated and bullied. When you don't deal with those feelings, they can build up inside you and turn into self-hate and anger. Looking back, it's clear that the police should have done a better job of checking things out and recognizing that something terrible might have happened. A legal rule called qualified immunity often protects police officers from being held responsible even when they make mistakes. This situation shows how complicated it can be to understand people's emotions and actions and how challenging it is for law enforcement to prevent terrible things from happening. In Richard's case, the years of bullying probably made him feel weak and powerless. To make up for that, he might have created a tough and robust version of himself in his mind. This image gave him power and control, even though it wasn't real. As time passed, he started to believe in this fake identity he'd created for himself. Things took a nasty turn when Emma, Richard's girlfriend online, rejected him romantically. This rejection triggered something profound inside Richard, something he'd kept hidden, his anger and hatred toward others. This anger had been hiding inside him, and Emma's rejection brought it out. He started acting out the brutal and violent person he'd pretended to be for so long. Melanie's mum, Kathleen, kept trying to get help from the police to find her daughter. She was distraught because she hadn't heard anything from Melanie, and Richard was telling different stories about where she was, but the police saw nothing wrong when they went to the Niederbrock home. Then, on September 18th, something really awful happened. The Farmville police entered the house because of the terrible smell and Kathleen's concerns. Inside, they found something horrifying. They discovered the bodies of Mark Niederbrock, Deborah Kelly, Emma Niederbrock, and Melanie Wells. They had all been beaten to death with a wooden splitting maul, a tool from the family's backyard. Clearly, they hadn't been able to defend themselves because they didn't have any wounds on their bodies, which suggests they were attacked while sleeping. The police were shocked and horrified by what they found, and they realized they had missed all the signs of these terrible murders when they visited earlier. What's even more shocking is that Richard was nowhere to be found at the scene. Earlier that day, he'd been in a car accident with Mark's vehicle and got in trouble for driving without a license. Even though he smelled terrible and something seemed off, the police let him go. After crashing the car, Richard went to a convenience store and called a taxi to take him to the airport. However, the cab got pulled over by the police for driving too fast, and what's strange is that Richard didn't seem worried about it at all. A few hours later, after the police discovered the terrible crime scene, a man named Andre Schrimm, who also went by Sick Tannic K, the soulless, called the police. He told them Richard had said some disturbing things about killing someone. 
With this information, the police found and arrested Richard at the airport on September 19th, stopping him from escaping to California. Richard's arrest helped uncover his horrifying crimes and the full extent of the tragedy in Farmville. It turned out that Richard had left a piece of paper with the airport address at the crime scene. He'd planned to escape by waiting for a flight in a couple of days, but something must have made him panic, so he tried to buy a ticket earlier, even though he couldn't afford it. This decision led to his arrest. When the police talked to Richard, he initially said he was willing to speak, but asked for a lawyer, which is his right. We advised you that you were in the rights. You said you understood your rights, and you signed the form saying you were willing to talk to us, and you still willing to talk to us? Yes, but I would like to have somebody here to like a lawyer. Okay, that, that, that is your option. So are you invoking your right to remain silent? Yes. He hadn't changed his clothes or cleaned up since the murders, so his clothing was covered in blood and gore when he was arrested. McCroskey confessed to his lawyer about what he did at the Niederbrock home in Farmville. He said he first killed Melanie in the living room, then went upstairs and killed Deborah, and finally he went into Emma's bedroom and killed her. He stayed in the house with their bodies for two days. On the second day, Mark Niederbrock came to the house to check on his family, and McCroskey killed him too. McCroskey said he did it because Emma's rejection made him angry and hurt. He didn't want any witnesses, so he killed the others, too. After he was arrested, some people wondered if the music he liked, called Horror Call Rap, was to blame for what he did. But there's no actual proof that violent music or movies make people do violent things. Millions of people listen to Horror Call music without causing harm. McCroskey lived a double life, pretending to be someone tough and influential online. But when he met Emma in person, she didn't like him, and he couldn't handle it. He had a history of feeling left out and teased by others, and this rejection was too much for him. So, he did something terrible. The scary part of the story started when they arrested Richard Sam McCroskey at the airport on September 19th. Just the day before that, the police found something terrible. They discovered the dead bodies of Pastor Mark Niederbrock, his wife Deborah Kelly, a teacher at Longwood University, their daughter Emma, and Emma's friend Melanie Wells. They'd all been beaten very badly. When the police searched Deborah Kelly's house, they found some scary things. A hammer with blood on it and a big heavy tool called a wood-splitting maul. They believed these were the weapons used in the killings. Nine long months passed since Sam got arrested, and lawyers on both sides were getting ready for the trial. They agreed to meet in court in September to discuss legal stuff, and they might decide on a date for the trial in October. The lawyers defending Sam still needed some important information. They were waiting to hear about DNA test results and a detailed mental evaluation of Sam. His lawyer, Carrie Bowen, thought they might need more tests to understand his mental state better. They hadn't decided yet whether they should ask for the trial to be held in a different place where people didn't already know about the case. They would decide that when they started picking the jury. They weren't sure if the government's lawyer would ask for the death penalty, which means Sam might be sentenced to death if found guilty. Sam, who was just 21, was starting to realize how serious this all was. He was stuck in a state of not knowing what would happen next, feeling nervous and accepting as he waited for the legal process to move forward. They had until August 16th to file legal papers for the case, and they planned to meet in court again on September 20th. Richard, also known as Sam McCroskey, pleaded guilty to serious charges, two counts of capital murder and two counts of first-degree murder. This meant he admitted to killing four people. Instead of facing the death penalty, he received four life sentences in prison, one after the other, and he agreed not to try to appeal his sentence. The reason why he committed these brutal murders remains unclear. When asked by reporters, he gave a cryptic answer, saying, Jesus told me to do it. However, his sister didn't think he meant it seriously. She thought he was just making a strange joke. Some people have suggested different theories. One theory is that he might have been jealous or angry because a girl named Emma rejected him romantically. Others think he might have wanted to kill Emma's parents and her friend Melanie to get rid of witnesses to what he did to Emma. Strangely, he kept on killing even after the first murders. This suggests he might have had a deep problem with violence. His behavior also showed that he could act charming and polite, fooling people into thinking he was normal, even though he might have a personality disorder called Antisocial Personality Disorder, APD. 
Even though he'd already killed Emma, he talked about her like he was still in love with her, which is something that people with personality disorders sometimes do. Ultimately, Richard's crimes were a mix of his violent tendencies, possibly using drugs or alcohol, and his intense anger and obsession. All of this led to the tragic deaths of four innocent people. When he was alone in the house with the bodies, not much was known about what happened. He didn't move the bodies until after the police came to check on things. He hinted that he might end his life and expressed anger and negativity about the world, society, and religion. All right, I'm making this video because it's in my final minutes of being alive. And uh, to anybody that finds this, I want you to tell my parents. I love them deeply. I'm very sorry for doing this. To my brother, Sinister, aka Eric. Deeply, and I'm sorry for going this route. I know I said I turned myself in, but I'm not gonna do that. I can't do that. I can't pay those consequences, so I gotta do what I gotta do, which is gonna be over there. And you can see that. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm not gonna tell you what I'm doing because I'm sure you guys know what I'm gonna do. Um, I'm really sorry. Some people blame the music he liked horrorcore for the murders because it seemed to celebrate violence. However, others argue that the music is just a fantasy and that only people with mental health problems would act on it. Regardless of his taste in music, what Richard did was driven by anger, resulting in the tragic deaths of a teacher, a pastor, a daughter, and a friend. The Farmville community will always remember and mourn the loss of these innocent lives. That's all for today. My last words before I go, fuck you to the world, fuck everybody in it, I can't stand this place, fuck your god, and no, I'm not a nut rider, but fuck your god, SKR, Wicked Intent, for life, peace.